Hi, welcome to this course. Great to have you on board. In this course, you will learn all about Power BI Desktop, Power BI Pro, Power BI Mobile, and more. Because Power BI is not a single tool, it's a set of combined tools. And in this course, you will learn all to go from zero to creating your own Power BI projects. We will learn all this step by step in an interactive course project. The project starts with Power BI Desktop, a local application which you can download to your Windows computer. Power BI Desktop is all about data preparation, data analysis and data visualization. And we will cover all these three parts in a lot of detail. After Power BI Desktop, we'll have a look at Power BI Pro, which allows us to bring our data from the local computer to the cloud. In Power BI Pro, you can collaborate in your projects with your colleagues and you can share projects within and outside your organization. We'll then continue with Power BI Mobile. It's, as the name indicates, a mobile application which allows you to access your data from anywhere from your mobile device. After that, we'll dive into more advanced features of Power BI. For example, we will learn how to create own custom visuals. Power BI ships with a lot of beautiful visuals, but if that's not enough, hey, then you can dive deeper and create visuals exactly according to your needs on your own. This and a lot more is what's inside the course. So what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Let's dive right into the course. And to do that, we should have a look at the most important question first. What is Power BI actually? On the official website, you can find this statement here telling you that Power BI is a business analytic solution. It allows you to visualize data and to share information and that it can be connected to hundreds of data sources and you can use it to create dashboards and reports. That's a nice statement indicating that Power BI is a quite powerful tool, but I guess it's a bit too complex at this stage because in simpler words, Power BI is a BI, a business intelligence tool, allowing you to analyze, visualize and share data. That's it in the end. And the awesome thing is that Power BI is a BI tool for everyone. So you don't need any prior experience to work with Power BI. Now, we will dive into all its core features throughout the course, but at this point, we should understand how Power BI is organized and structured to allow everyone to become a BI expert. For that, we should have a look at the three core areas of Power BI. The first core area is the data preparation and analysis. So anything related to data or tables, you could say. Data preparation means connecting Power BI to different source files and to work on that raw information. This can mean that you want to work on columns, delete columns, for example, or you might want to change the data format from a text to a number. The goal of the data preparation is to have shaped or prepared data, which you can then use to perform your analysis. Analyzing data in Power BI could mean simple tasks like calculating averages or more complex calculations we'll have a look at throughout the course. With the data related part finished, we can continue with the next core area, visualizations, because you can of course present data as simple tables. This is also possible in Power BI, but you can also create lots of different visuals. This can be line charts, column charts, bar charts, or more advanced visuals like maps, for example. So that's the second core area. We now saw that we can work on data and that we can present our results. And this brings us to the third and last core area of Power BI, collaboration and sharing. Because you can work on your own in Power BI, this is possible, but you can also work together in teams and you can also share your results then within your organization or even outside your organization. This is collaboration and sharing. So these are the three core areas making Power BI such a powerful BI tool. The last question now is how does Power BI do this though? Which tools do I have to achieve all these goals? Well, this brings us to the core Power BI toolset. Because Power BI isn't a single tool, it's a set of multiple combined tools interacting with each other. And these core tools are Power BI Desktop, Power BI Service or Pro, and Power BI Mobile. Let's get started with Power BI Desktop. Power BI Desktop is a local application. This means it's a program you can download for free to your computer with one single restriction though, it's only available for Windows machines. 
With Power BI Desktop, you have a very strong tool covering many of the core areas we just talked about already. Because in Power BI Desktop, you can work on data sets. This means the initial data preparation we just talked about, so the connection to the source files and the work on that information, and also the data analysis part, meaning that you apply your own calculations to the information to get the insights you need into your data. You can also create visuals in Power BI Desktop. As I said, we have line charts, bar charts, column charts, maps, even combined charts. So many, many different ways to visualize information in Power BI Desktop. To bring more structure into your visuals, Power BI has the so-called report feature. A report simply allows you to organize your visuals on different pages. So you have one page, for example, with revenue data, a second page with cost data, just to give you a Simple example here, and in the end, all these different pages are summarized in one report. This is what Power BI Desktop is about in a nutshell. As you can see, it's a very, very powerful tool already. It has one core restriction though. It can be downloaded to your machine, and therefore you are kind of alone when you work in Power BI Desktop. Now, this can be okay for certain projects, but typically, if you work in an organization, you are not alone and you're working in teams. And this brings us to the second core Power BI tool, Power BI Service or Pro. Power BI Service is a cloud application. This means you just need a, an account, a Power BI account, and then you can use it to log into Power BI Service. This means it's not limited to Windows only, you only need a browser to, well, access this website. What can we do in Power BI Service now? Well, Power BI Service is not the tool to work on datasets. That's part of Power BI Desktop, therefore we don't have the strong data preparation and analysis capabilities we just talked about in Power BI Desktop. Power BI Service can be used to create visuals and reports though. This is possible, but it works basically the same way as it does in Power BI Desktop. Therefore, in this course, we will focus on to Power BI Desktop when it comes to visuals and reports and not dive too deep into this area in Power BI Service. Because there is actually another part where Power BI Service really shines. And this is creating dashboards. Dashboards are summary pages, you could say. So one single page with the core visuals of the report. This could be a page you present to your executive to give him an overview of the most important numbers. From the dashboard, you can then dive into the report and into single visuals if you want to, but the dashboard is the first thing you see. Now, as I talk about presenting dashboards to your executive, this brings us to the other really strong part of Power BI Service, this is collaboration and results sharing. Because Power BI Service is the tool you need when it comes to any kind of interaction with other people, be it inside your team, be it inside your organization, or even outside your organization. You can use Power BI Service to collaborate on your project and to share the final results with other people. And this sharing part also brings us to the last core Power BI toolset, Power BI Mobile, as the name indicates, Power BI Mobile is a mobile app, which you can download from the Google Play Store or the App Store if you have an Apple device. And it simply allows us to access our information, our dashboards, our reports from anywhere. And this is now the core Power BI toolset. That was the theory part and throughout this course, we'll dive into all these tools. We'll see how these tools interact in a real, interactive project, but now we should get started first and we will get started with Power BI Desktop. So let's dive into the world of Power BI Desktop. For that, we have to download it first. To do so, we should go to the official Microsoft website here, powerbi.microsoft.com. And there, if you go to products, click onto it, you can select Power BI Desktop. If you do so, you have two options to download it now, download free and see download or language options. This one is fine, you can do this, but I recommend the advanced download option here as it allows you to, well, select the language and as it also provides some additional information, we'll have a look at in a few seconds. So let's click on to see download or language options. Now this new window opens and if we scroll down a bit here, we can first see that we can select the language Power BI 
desktop should be installed and downloaded in. I'll go with English here. I recommend you to do the same at this point. And if we scroll down a bit further, you can also open this system requirements menu. Here you see which requirements Power BI Desktop has. You see the required operating system. And down here, you see that you need a 32-bit or 64-bit Windows platform. If you are not sure here if you have a 32-bit or 64-bit platform, you can simply press the Windows key on your keyboard and then enter System Information. Then you can open this app right here. And there, under the system type, you see that I have a 64-bit based um, PC. If you have 32-bit here, then you should go with the 32-bit version. And you can select the corresponding version now if you go to download. There you have the two options, so 64-bit for me, this would be the 32-bit version. And now, by clicking next, the download should start, as you can see down here, can take a few seconds. And once this download is finished, we'll continue with the installation of Power BI Desktop. The download finished, so you should have this executable file here. If you double click it, the installation wizard starts. So you can again select the language. We selected English already, so we'll stick to this one. Pressing next will bring us to the next menu. Here we can simply click on to next. We can accept the license agreement, press next once again. There you can now change the path where Power BI Desktop should be installed to. For me, the default one works totally fine, so I'll click next once again. And then we can start the installation. I'll also create a desktop shortcut here. Maybe you do the same. So let's press install. Now this, again, takes a few seconds. Now the installation is done. And now we could launch Power BI Desktop immediately. I will untick this though and start it manually as I want to give you one additional information at this point. So let's untick this box and press finish. And now you have the Power BI Desktop um, well, application here on the desktop. If we now double click it, we open Power BI Desktop, and with that, we open a new project. That's important at this point, because if we open a new project, we also have to save a new one. We'll do this later throughout this introduction video. Just keep in mind, if you open Power BI Desktop like this, a new project will be opened. What you can see here now is the starting screen, the starting menu. Don't get distracted by this sign in part here. This is required for Power BI Service or Power BI Pro. So we'll cover this later throughout the course. For Power BI Desktop, no sign in is required. Now we could directly connect Power BI Desktop to a source file if we go to get data right here. But I would like to go to the options menu first to show you one very important option for Power BI Desktop in general, but also to follow along this course conveniently. So let's close this pop-up here. And now we see the Power BI Desktop interface, something we'll explore in a lot of detail in the next module. For now, just go to File, now to Options and Settings, right here. And now we go to Options, up there. In this menu, please go down to Current File, down here, and select Regional Settings. This menu allows you to set the so-called locale. As you can see here, the locale is important to interpret numbers, dates, and time, etc. So it's basically important to make sure that if I apply a change to data, to data formats, that this change is also applied accordingly in your project. For your individual projects, you can use different locales. For the purpose of this course, I highly recommend to use English United States right here, also the locale I use. So. Just make sure that this is set correctly and press OK. And now we are back in Power BI Desktop. The problem we have, of course, is that we don't have any kind of data in our project. Let's change this quickly. For that, we stay in this home ribbon here and go to get data. If you click it in the lower part, you get a quick summary of some common data sources. If you click it in the upper part right here, you get an overview of all data sources. And as you can see, Power BI Desktop ships with a lot of data sources, many of these covered throughout this course. You can also select different data sources by category, for example, file data sources like Excel, CSV and so on, or databases like SQL. Or you can also use this search option here. And if I now enter web, then you see we have this web source type. And that's the source type I want to use for this introduction project. If you select it and press connect, then, well, you can connect Power BI Desktop to a specific website. 
What is missing here though is our URL. Let's quickly get one. And here we will now search for the IMF World Economic Outlook Database. This one. Now, in my case, the April 2020 version is the latest one. If you have a more recent version at the point in time where you are watching this course, you can, of course, use this one because the structure will remain the same. You will just have more updated data. Talking about data quickly, the IMF World Economic Outlook database simply provides GDP data, so gross domestic product data, for different countries for different years. Therefore, it's a really nice data set to quickly get started with Power BI Desktop. Enough of the words, let's select this April 2020 version here in my case. Here we can now download or access the information. I will use by countries here in this menu. On the next page, we'll select all countries, this option. Um, we can continue here, so we can select all our countries. Here we can now select the type of GDP data we want to download. I'll go with the gross domestic product in current prices, so the second option right here. So let's now press continue. Here we can now select a date range, we'll keep the default one. And with that, we can now press prepare report. And now we have our information already. As you can see, if you scroll to the right, you have now GDP data for different years for different countries. Now we could download the information with this download button or alternatively, we can directly access the information now from the browser, from the website, so to say. To do so, please select the URL up here, right click it and now press copy. Now go back to Power BI Desktop and now right click and paste this URL and click OK. Now this pop-up opens as Power BI Desktop wants to know how it should access this information on this website. As we don't have any critical data here, we can simply go with Anonymous here and access this information on the website without any specific credentials. So we can press connect here. And here we are now in the so-called navigator. The navigator now allows us to select the data or specific data that we want to receive from the website. We have two views available here, the so-called table view and the web view. The default view is this table view and in this left part here you can see the content of the website divided into different tables, into different parts of the page you could say. And if you click onto one of these tables you can see that this is, well, this part of the page, this right here is another one. And here, table 5, this is the actual content that we need, so our data with the different columns and the GDP data. We also have this web view, as I said, this one right here. This presents us the entire web page. However, as you can see right here, the web view is a bit buggy from time to time, unfortunately, because normally you should be able to see the different tables here highlighted so that you could directly select the tables here also in the web view. This is not working here at the moment. Probably it's the same for you. Therefore, I recommend to go back to the table view and to quickly check the content of the page right here. And as I said, table five is the one that we have to select and to finally select it we have to tick this box right here next to table 5. Now with this table being selected we also have two options down here load and transform data. Now a short note at this point this is just the introduction project here so the goal is to guide you through the first steps in Power BI Desktop to show you how easy it is to connect Power BI Desktop to data and to create your first visuals. Throughout the course, we'll dive a lot deeper into everything and a lot more you'll see in this introduction project. So for the moment, just follow along and enjoy the easiness of using Power BI Desktop. A quick preview on load versus transform data at this point though. Load would mean that you immediately load the information into your so-called data model. So this would mean that you want to immediately start visualizing your data, you could say. Transform data is the data preparation part I was talking about in the last lecture. This is this connecting Power BI Desktop to source files, but then working on columns, data formats, and so on. Therefore, we'll now select transform data here to see if we have to prepare our information. And if we do so, you see something interesting. You see a new menu, a new interface, and a new window which is opening. 
I can prove this to you if I click onto this button to make the window a bit smaller. You see, we still have our initial menu in the background with some pending changes. We'll cover that later throughout the course. And now we have a separate window and this is the so-called Query Editor or Power Query Editor as it's named since a recent update. Now this Power Query Editor or Query Editor as I will refer to throughout the course now allows you to work on the connection to the source files and also on the structure of the information displayed right here. This means now it's time to explore this Query Editor and to do our first data preparation steps. As mentioned before, this is just the introduction project, therefore I'll just guide you through the core steps required for this project. We'll dive into everything you see right here and a lot more in a lot of detail throughout the course. Therefore, a very quick intro on what you can see right here. In the center part, you have the information that we saw on the website now imported into Power BI Desktop. In the left part, you see our so-called queries, so our connections to the source files. Here we have one connection to the website. In the right part, you have the so-called applied steps. This will present and store all changes applied to our data here. These three steps were automatically applied by Power BI Desktop, by the way. And up here, you see we have different ribbons we can click through. And each ribbon comes with different options, mainly related to the information here in the center of our screen. So what should we do with this information now? Well, the goal is to have a cleaned and prepared data set we can use to then create our visual. And for that, we first should work on the column names because here you can select the individual columns and you see we have column one, column two and so on. Not the best column names at this stage, especially as row number two. This one here has country, subject descriptor, units and so on. So it already contains our correct column names. Now we could manually rename these columns here. This would be possible. But a better way would be to delete this first column here. And with that, our row two would become our new row one. And then we could turn this first row into our column names, into our so-called header. This means we have two steps we should do right here. We should delete this existing first row and then we should turn our new first row, this one here, into the column names. To do so, we go to the home ribbon up here and there you have this reduce rows area. If you click on to remove rows, you see we have plenty of options. In our case, the first one is the required option, remove top rows. Let's select this. And now we have to specify how many rows starting from the top we want to remove. Well, in our case, we want to remove row one. Therefore, we should simply enter one right here, press OK. And the first row is immediately gone, also indicated by the removed top row step here in the right part in our applied steps column. So whenever you accidentally do a wrong step here, you can simply undo this by clicking onto this X symbol left to that applied step, just as a side note. With the first step done, we now need to turn this row into our column names. To do so, we can again go to the home ribbon, now go to the right part of the screen here and click on to use first row as headers, like this. And now we have the correct column names, country, subject descriptor, units and so on. This was quite easy, wasn't it? Now, as we're talking about columns here at the moment, we should check if we need all these different columns that we have in our data. You can select the columns with the mouse, as I did it right here, or navigate through different columns with the left and right arrow key on your keyboard. So we could say that the country, yeah, this is a column we need. The subject descriptor showing you that we have the GDP here, this is also fine. But the units, for example, I don't think we need that column. Therefore, we can now either go again to our home ribbon, this one, and go to remove columns, right, and therefore remove this existing column. Or alternatively, we can right click onto that column and press remove up here. Let's go with this approach now to remove the column. The scale can be kept, this is fine. Here we have an empty column, so again the same approach, right click and remove. And the remaining columns showing our GDP data, I think these are all right. Let's see if we have any additional unrequired column. Yes, the last one here. So one last time, right click and remove. And with that, we already improved our columns a lot. 
However, I'm still not happy with the result because now we should work on the structure of our data. Because if you have a look at the first columns, we have the country, we have the scale, and then we have all these different years. Now, wouldn't it be more in line with our current structure if we would have country, then back here maybe a column named year, and then one column named GDP. Because with that, each individual topic would be covered in a separate column and the corresponding values would be stored inside that column. I think this would be a good idea. And to do that, we simply can select the 2014 column. Now scroll to the right, press and hold the shift button on our keyboard and select the 2021 column. Now all columns should be selected. And what I want to do now is I want to turn these individual columns into two new columns with one column being the year and the corresponding year values we can see here as the column names and with the second column containing all the corresponding GDP data. So all this information that is now stored in separate columns should be stored in this individual column then. Sounds a bit complex at this stage, but it's a really helpful feature. So let's do it and then take a closer look at it again. To apply this transformation, we should now not go to the home ribbon, but to the transform ribbon here. And here we can now go to unpivot columns. And this unpivot option will exactly do what I was just explaining. So if we select this, you see that we now have two columns only. All the other columns are gone or are not gone actually, are structured or organized differently. Now this attribute column here contains all the annual data, so all the data for the different years, and the value column contains the GDP data. This means we reduced the amount of columns, but of course increased the row count, because now all the different years are stored in a different row before these were stored in different columns. With that, we achieved a big step already. What we should do now is we should maybe rename this column. So we can do this with a simple double click and naming it year, pressing enter. Alternatively, we can also right click here and go down to rename and name it GDP, also hitting enter. So this looks already very good. We are almost done with our data preparation here. There are just two important steps missing. One step is to change the data format, because at the moment, all our information is stored as text. You can see this indicated by this ABC symbol here. And if you click onto that, you see that we can change the data format like this. But before we do that, and that's very important also for the rest of the course, we should make sure that if we want to change the data format from a text that we have right here to a number, we should make sure that the information stored here can be converted to a different format because here the GDP should not be stored as text, it should be stored as a number actually. Therefore, we should ensure that it contains only data which can be formatted as a number. To do that, we can simply click onto this arrow next to the column name. And here we have the filter menu. The filter menu allows you to change the order the information is displayed and it allows you to scroll through the data to see if you have any unwanted values. If you scroll down right here, for example, you can see that we have an NA value down there. And this NA value can't be formatted as a number, therefore this would cause errors. So this means if we now unselect NA, it will be excluded from our data. And this will then allow us to format the data correctly. So let's press OK here. And now we can change the data format. And to do that, I showed you that already, we can simply click onto the symbol and now change the GDP to a decimal number like this. And the same thing can be done for the year. So let's click right here. We could actually format it as a date, but for the purpose of the introduction project, we can simply format it as whole number, totally sufficient at this point. And with that, we did our first data preparation. As you can see, these were lots of steps actually for an introduction project, but it shows you how powerful Power BI Desktop is. What we have to do now is we have to leave our query editor and load this information into our so-called data model. This means we should make sure that we get the information from that editor into this part of Power BI Desktop, you could say. To do that, we go to File and now press Close and Apply right here, like this. If you do so, you see the query editor is closing and the query changes are now applied and the data is loaded into our data model.
And in this data model, we will now finally create our visuals. We prepared the data and we now have the information stored in our data model, but we cannot see any data at this point. Why is this the case? Well, because we are in the so-called report view right here at the moment. This is the part where we will create our visualizations. But you can already see this fields column in the right part here. So this indicates that we have some information available in Power BI Desktop in our data model. Before we use this information though, we should switch to another view, the so-called data view, which is right here. In this data view, you can now see again our prepared information. This is our final data set now loaded into the data model. We could apply calculations in here now, this will be covered later throughout the course, but I actually only want to apply one change here at this point. This change is related to the country column here, because at the moment this country information is stored as text, which is fine, but you can also tell Power BI that you have specific data here, specific data types in here you could say because we have text, but actually this column contains countries, so geographic information. And the information that we have countries here, so the geographic information will become important in a few minutes. Now to tell Power BI Desktop that we have countries here, we select the country column, as I did it already, and now we have these column tools here. In these column tools, we see the data type right here, so text. These are the same options we saw in the query editor. But here in this properties area, we have the data category. At the moment we have uncategorized data. But if you open this menu, you have plenty of options on how to provide additional information on the data category for Power BI Desktop. In our case, the right category is country. Important, not county, but country down here. With that change applied, nothing changed at first sight here, but if you look into the right part into these fields, which are by the way equal to the ones we saw in our report view here, you see we have this globe symbol in front of the country, indicating that Power BI Desktop is now aware of the fact that this is geographic information. With that change being applied, we can get back to our report view and now finally create our first visual. To create visuals in Power BI Desktop, you have this visualizations column here. And you can select the visualization type directly in here. Let's say we want to go with this one right here, the stacked column chart. Just select it. And now you have this blueprint, you could say, for your visual. We don't have any data in it, but you can drag it around, center it as you want, or even make it bigger. I think that's the right option in our case. And now you can center it like this and like that. So we now have the blueprint for the visual, but we need some information in here. And for that, we need our fields. So again, this column to the right. Because now we have to interact between our visualizations here and these fields containing the actual data. And with the visualization being selected right here, we now can interact between these two columns. This means if I want to get started with presenting the GDP, I can simply select it here and now drag and drop it into a specific data field of the visual. In our case, the GDP would be a value that we want to display, so we can drag and drop it right here. Now, the GDP data is applied right here, but not very spectacular. We need some additional information to make this chart a bit more fancy. For that, we can now select the year and drag and drop it as the axis maybe. Now we quickly created our chart presenting the GDP for different years. What's missing though is the country specific information, right? Because like this, we just have it on a global level. We can also do this. Let's go back to our fields and now take our country and drag it to the legend. Now we have more details in our chart. Now we have the GDP for different years for different countries. The problem is that we have a bit too much information in here now, because nobody can see a thing right here. You could click to the right to see all the countries, but I don't think this adds any value. What we need right here at this stage maybe is a so-called filter to maybe only display the top 10 countries, so the countries with the most contribution to the GDP. For that, we have this filter column here. In this filter column, we can now say that we want to apply specific filters on this visual right here. In our case, I want to filter for the top 10 countries by the GDP. 
Therefore, the country is the important filter that we have to use right here. For that, we can hover to the country and now expand this menu. There, we can now select the filter type. A basic filtering would allow us to individually select the countries. But I just want to select a top 10 filter. Therefore, we select this menu and now go to top N, this one. Now we have to specify which top N should be presented. So N in our case should be the top 10 countries. But the top 10 countries by what? Well, by the GDP. Therefore, we can again go to our fields column and add this data field right there. Pressing apply filter now will, well, apply the filter. And now we only have the top 10 countries here in our visualization. Again, we did a big change to our visual with just this simple step. We are almost done with our introduction project at this point, but we actually changed the data category of our countries. You remember this globe symbol which I added a few minutes ago. So for country specific data, wouldn't a world map be the better visual? I think so. And we can immediately change this by simply selecting our visual, that's important, and now selecting the globe symbol right there. If we do so, you see we immediately get a world map in Power BI Desktop with our top 10 countries. The problem here is that we have the information for each single year in here. I just want to have the cumulative GDP data for each country for all the years. Therefore, what we can do now is we can simply unselect the legend. So we go to the legend area and click onto this X. With that, we now have the GDP data in a cumulative way. And the bigger the GDP, the bigger this bubble right here. What's missing here maybe is the country name. This will be our last addition to this visual and to change specific visual effects of our visual, we can go to this menu here, the format menu. If you click onto this, you have plenty of options on how to interact with your visual, also covered throughout the course, of course. But at this point, I only want to add the so-called data category. So if we switch this to on, you see we now have the information regarding the country where the specific GDP belongs to also added to our visual. And with that, we finished our first Power BI project and you also saw lots of core features already in this little example. One last thing is missing though, and this is saving the project of course, because as I said in the beginning, if you open a new instance of Power BI Desktop, a new project will be opened. Therefore, let's save this current project by clicking onto the save button in the left upper part of the screen. Now you can select a location. In my case, I will just save it on the desktop and I will call it uh, initial project maybe. And it will be stored as PBIX file. These are Power BI Desktop project files. If you save this now, your project is stored. You can now access it whenever you need it. And we can now continue with the next important part of this course, the course outline, because this course is packed with content and I want to make sure that you know what you can expect from this course. What's inside this course? What does it offer to make you a Power BI expert? We are almost done with getting started. And in the next module, we will have a look at the prerequisites. Not at the course prerequisites, but at the Power BI desktop prerequisites. Meaning we'll have a look at the interface or at recommended options. So basically anything you need to make sure you already feel familiar with the tool and the look and feel of Power BI desktop. Because in the third module, we'll dive into the course project and there we'll have a closer look at the query editor. We'll again see how we can work with columns and rows as you saw it in the introduction project already, but we'll dive a lot deeper here. So we'll have a look at how we can connect Power BI Desktop to different data sources, how we can use features like append or merge, and how we can even create our own data schema, our own data model schema here with Power BI Desktop in the query editor because the final goal of this module will be to have our own data set, which is based on multiple different sources. With this data set being finished, we will of course load this data set into our data model and there we'll start analyzing our data. This analysis part is a really crucial part of Power BI Desktop as it allows you to finally gain insights into your data, for example, by applying calculations to the information you have, but it also allows you to enhance your current data schema, for example, by establishing relationships or by using DAX, 
DAX stands for Data Analysis Expression. This is a special language allowing you to write different formulas, which then allow you, well, to gain these insights into your data. With the analyzing data part being finished, we will conclude this first core part of the course with the visualization part. Here we'll work in the report view, we'll create different visuals, starting from simple line charts, bar charts or column charts, up to more complex data types like combined charts, slicers and a lot more. This will be the first core part of this course. It's the local work in Power BI Desktop. But as you learned already, Power BI has more to offer than this local work in Power BI Desktop. And this more will be tackled in the next part of this course. Here we'll dive into Power BI Service or Pro. That's the cloud application. This means here we will create a new account and log in to this cloud service. And we will then learn how we can use our finished Power BI Desktop project and publish it to Power BI Service. In Power BI Service, we'll then learn how we can create dashboards, how we can collaborate inside our team with so-called workspaces and apps, and we'll also learn how we can share our work with other people inside and outside of our organization. We'll then conclude this sharing and collaborating part of the course with Power BI Mobile. This means we will install the mobile app and have a look at how we can access it and at the options this app offers. So to summarize that, this will be the collaboration and sharing part of the course. We could stop here, but we are not done yet, because we will then continue with having a look at additional data sources. Because up to this point, we mainly worked with text files, CSV files or Excel files, but Power BI has lots of different so-called connectors. So the connectors allow you to connect Power BI Desktop to the source files. And in this module, we'll have a look at many of these. Just to give you one example here, we'll have a look at how we can connect Power BI Desktop to SQL or NoSQL databases. Once we also learned how we can use this more advanced data sources, we'll also make sure that you always stay up to date. Because the Power BI toolset is constantly evolving. It gets an amazing support by Microsoft, the tool constantly evolves and therefore we want to make sure that you stay up to date, therefore we'll have a look at specific resources you can check and also specific parts of the tool you can dive into to make sure you can stay up to date and which also allow you to track specific changes or updates that might be coming in the near future. These two modules are the dive deeper part of the course. So with that, you already have a really solid understanding of the Power BI toolset. But we are still not done yet, because then we'll have a look at advanced features. This advanced features part dives into specific features of Power BI Desktop, which were not covered yet, but which become interesting once you have the required basic knowledge. And this also covers the developers part, because Power BI also allows people with at least basic programming language to create own visuals, for example. Now, these advanced features will be covered in this part of the course, and this is really the part where you will master Power BI and really become an expert in it. And after that, we are finally done, then we will round up that course and show you some next steps how to continue after finishing this journey. With that, we are almost ready to get started and to dive into the prerequisites. But before we do so, let's make sure that you really get the most out of this course. How do you get the most out of this course? Because you are part of this course and we want to make sure that you really get as much out of it as possible. And for that, we have some things that you should keep in mind. The first thing is quite obvious, watch the videos. It's an on-demand video course, so well, you kind of should watch the videos to learn something here. However, watch the videos at your speed and pause and rewind if necessary. We do our best to find a good balance between too slow and too fast, but this doesn't work for every student. Therefore, use the tools you have in the video player, you can slow us down or even increase the playback speed in case we are too slow. If you didn't understand something when watching the video the first time, pause that part and rewind it. That's not bad at all. It's a really good thing to rethink about certain concepts and to really only continue with the video once these concepts are clear. 
In addition to that, work along and do the exercises. This entire course is built in an interactive way. You saw it in the introduction project already. This course is built to work along. Throughout the course, you'll not only have the course project, but also different assignments and quizzes. And make sure to do these, because these will help you to remember the knowledge and to practice the things we learn throughout the course. With that, you can really make sure that you understood what we learned so far in the course. And as for the videos itself, make sure to do these exercises and work along at your speed. I want to emphasize this once again here. Additionally, make sure to use the course resources. Attached to different lectures and attached to the last lecture of each module, you can find our project. So in case you're stuck, in case something isn't working, you can use these resources and see what you did differently when compared to us. And with that, it's easy to track down any kind of differences and therefore you can easily make sure your project is working again. Besides that, you cannot only find project files, but also links. These links allow you to dive a bit deeper into specific topics, which might not be the core focus of the course, but which might be interesting to you in your specific project. So make sure to use these project files and also dive into the links provided. Even though you have the project files and the links, you might get stuck throughout the course. That's not a problem, because you can ask in the course Q&A section. In this Q&A section, we and also other students do our best to make sure we can help you here and to solve your problem. But that's just one side of the medal, you could say. Because, well, to be honest, asking and waiting for a response, that's easy. But this should be an interactive thing, as the entire course actually is. Therefore, besides asking, also make sure to help others in the Q&A section. And I'm not saying this because we're lazy and we don't want to answer your questions. We will answer your questions. But the best way to learn and to practice what you learned is to help others because a student has a question and then you can try your best to answer this question. And there is nothing you have to lose right here. Because if your answer is wrong, well, then you will get corrected and then you learn something and the student who asked the question will learn something. But if you were right, well, then that's a great proof for you because you saw that you learned something in the course and that you understood the concepts. Well, and for the student to ask, it's also good because he or she received an answer. So to summarize our helping part here, great learnings are guaranteed if you do so. That's the whole introduction module. With that, you already know what Power BI is all about, what you will learn throughout the course and how you get the most out of this course. Therefore, let's dive into the course now and continue with the next module where we dive into the Power BI prerequisites. Welcome to this module. In this module, we will explore the desktop application, so Power BI Desktop, because we want to make sure that you are familiar with the interface and also with some other prerequisites required to follow along this course conveniently. What's inside this module now? Well, first we'll have a look at how you can use the attached project files. Throughout the course, you will find several attachments and here you will learn how you can use these. After that, we'll have a look at the Power BI Desktop workflow because Power BI Desktop comes with lots of different tools. You saw the query editor already, you saw this data model and the report view, for example. And I want to make sure that you know how these different tools connect and how this workflow inside Power BI Desktop works. Additionally, we'll have a look at the data model. This is the part of Power BI Desktop you can see when you open it initially. So this part with the final data model, you could say, where you can also create your visualizations. And here we will dive a bit deeper into the interface to make sure you know where you can find which tools, which features. After the data model, we'll also go back to the query editor and also explore the interface here to make sure you know how you can prepare your data efficiently. Finally, We'll dive into the recommended settings. We'll have a look at some core options of Power BI Desktop and we'll also prepare our Power BI Desktop course file, which I highly recommend to use throughout this course. This is what's inside this module. So what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Throughout the course, you will find my current state of the project attached to different lectures. In case you're stuck or something went wrong with your project, you can then download my project and compare it to yours. To make sure this works successfully, you have to know some steps which you have to apply to be able to use this project. Let's have a look at these steps now. 
And for that, you can find my project attached to this lecture. It's a zip file. Make sure to download this zip file. It's this zip file right here. Once you downloaded it, make sure to unzip it with a tool of your choice. I'm using WinRAR here, for example. So just double click it then. And in this zip file, you can now find the PBIX file, so the current Power BI project file, and a source folder. In this folder, you can find all the relevant source files for this specific project state. In this case, we have a GDP data CSV file because this is actually our initial project from the last module, but now linked to a local ACSV file, no longer linked to the web, therefore. Make sure to select this folder and the corresponding Power BI project file and, well, drag and drop it to a folder of your choice. Now, you can open this PBIX file. And at first sight, everything looks all right. You can see the map that we created, no errors right here. But if you now click onto this refresh button up here, which will reload the entire data model, you see we have a problem because we could not find the file because this path right here is no longer valid. In this case, it points to a wrong folder. In your case, it would point to a folder on my machine, which obviously is not available on your computer. What you have to do with each of the downloadable project files, therefore, is you have first have to close this window. Now you go to transform data and click it in the lower part. And now you go to data source settings, this option here. In these data source settings, you can find the current data sources in this Power BI file. And as you can see, we are currently are using this path right here, pointing towards this GDP data.csv file. But apparently this path is wrong. Now, click on to change source. There you can again find the path and also some settings related to the way you open this file, but you can leave the defaults here. Now go to browse and now go to the source folder you just unzipped. Double click it and in this folder you can find this gdpdata.csv file. Press open and OK and then close this pop-up. Now you see that we have some pending changes in our queries. This means we connected Power BI Desktop to the source file and now we have to load this data from the query editor into our data model. And by clicking apply changes here, this will, well, apply these changes and reload. And as you can see now, we don't have any more problems. Even if you press refresh once again, the refresh works successfully and the file is correctly connected to our source file. Now make sure to save this updated path by clicking on to, well, save right here. And with that, you're ready to go. This is how you can use the attached project files. With that, we successfully connected Power BI Desktop to our source file. One important note at this point too, if you switch to the data view, this is typically empty. You can simply change that by selecting one of the columns here in the right part of this field. So in case this is uh, hidden, you can click onto this arrow and then for example, select the country column. With that, the data will be reloaded and you can see the content of our file. Talking about the report view and this data view right here, we already saw that we have this query editor, we have the data model with the report view and the data view and this third option down here. So before we dive deeper into this whole interface here, I think it's important how Power BI Desktop actually works. What does the Power BI Desktop workflow look like? Query editor, data model, data view, report view, lots of different terms at this point. And now the question is, how do all these terms work together? Where can we do what in Power BI Desktop and especially why? Let's have a look at the Power BI Desktop workflow. Because generally you can divide this workflow into three different core areas. The data preparation, the data modeling and the data visualization. The data preparation is the part we saw in the query editor. This is the part that is all about connecting Power BI Desktop to our source files, to this raw data in the end, and working on this raw data to get our actual data set. The data set is the data we want to work with finally, the data we want to analyze. This means once we finish this preparation, we use this close and apply method to load the data from the query editor into our so-called data model. And this data model consists of two parts then, the data modeling and the data visualization. Data modeling is performed in the data view and the relationship view. 
We haven't seen the relationship view so far. This allows us to establish connections between different tables. We'll dive into this in a lot of detail throughout the course. The data view is the view we saw already. This was the part where we could decide that our country column contains geographical information, for example. So data modeling is this part where the data analysis takes place, where we further work on our prepared data set, you could say. The difference to the data preparation here, by the way, is that the data preparation is more focused on cleaning the data. The data modeling has this data analysis emphasis. So as I mentioned it already, we apply calculations, for example, to get insights into our data. The data visualization, well, this takes place in the report view then. We saw this already. This was the view where we could create our different visuals. So this is an important workflow. We'll come back to this workflow several times throughout the course to make sure you remember this and you keep this in mind. But in the end, data preparation, data modeling, and data visualization. Data preparation takes place in the query editor. Data modeling and visualization is done in the data model. And this is also the way I will use these terms throughout the course. So that's the theory. But what do these parts of Power BI Desktop look like in practice? Let's explore the interfaces now and let's get started with the interface of the data model. I'm back in the project in the default view whenever you start Power BI Desktop, the report view in the data model. In the data model, we have four different core areas. We have these ribbons on top here. We have these three buttons to the left. We have this center part, you could say, with the content of the corresponding view, and we have these columns to the right. Let's get started with these three buttons maybe, because if you think back about the slide regarding the workflow, you see that the data model consists of the report view, the data view, and the relationship view. And we can switch between these three views with these buttons. The default one is the report view, where the report, the current visual, is displayed. Then we have the data view with the underlying data in our data model. And we have the relationship view. This doesn't help us too much at this stage as relationships are all about establishing connections between different tables in our data model. At the moment, we only have one table. Therefore, this is not too helpful at this stage. But the important thing is, depending on the view you select, different types of content are displayed here. Now, we see here in our relationship view that we have the table name up here and our column names or our fields. And these fields can also be seen in the right part here. Because if you expand the menu here, you see we have these fields once again. And this fields column is also available in the data view right here and in the report view. Because the fields indicated here as the corresponding column names contain the underlying information in our data. And with these fields, we can then interact with the content in the corresponding view. For example, in the report view, if I select a current visual, I can interact with it. For example, I can unselect the GDP or edit, or I can drag and drop new values into specific areas of our visual. Same thing can be done in the data view. If I go there too, I can select a specific column, for example, right here, right there, or right there. So fields are the interaction part between our content and define what should be displayed here. Now, when we had a look at this fields column, we see that in the data view, we only have one single column, so just the fields. In the relationship view, we have two columns, fields and properties. Properties will become important later when we work on relationships. And in the report view, we have three columns, fields, visualizations, and filters. We use the filter already here to filter for our top 10 countries by the GDP. So these filters allow us to specifically tailor the information that should be displayed in our visual. And here in the visualizations column, we have the option to interact with our current visual. For example, here, when it comes to the type of data that is displayed in the visual, or right here to change the style, the format of our visual by disabling or enabling the category labels or by changing the visual type by simply selecting a different one like this or like that. So these are the three core areas down here. We can switch between different views, which has an impact onto our content that is displayed and also onto the columns here displayed to the right. But it's all about fields and the corresponding content in the end. What about these ribbons up here now? Well, these ribbons also change depending on the view and depending on our selection of the content in the corresponding view. 
I selected the visual here in the report view. Therefore, I have two additional ribbons, format right here and data drill. If I unselect that visual, these ribbons are gone because I can't interact with a specific visual as I didn't select one. If I go to the data view, you see we have these column tools here. We have these column tools because we previously selected a column, scale right here. If I select country, well, column tools are still available, but now for the country field or the country column. And if I go right here to the left and click on to GDP data, so our table, then the column tools are gone. Now we refer to our entire table. If I go to the relationship view, for example, you see we don't have these ribbons. We only have home and help for the moment. Talking about the home ribbon, the home ribbon is available in all different views and it summarizes some core features, you could say. Options available in all different views are data and queries. These are all about the connection to our source files and about access to the query editor. If you go to the relationship view, to the home ribbon, you see we also have data and queries. Same thing is the case here in the report view. We also got data and queries. We still got some unique options also depending on the view we are using. For example, in the report view, we have this insert option related to creating new visuals, which can also be accessed in more detail here in this insert ribbon. This would not be available here in our data view as the data view is not about creating visuals. What we have in both though, the data view and the report view are these calculations. Calculations will create new columns or new fields. Therefore, if I create a new field, I want to see this field maybe here in the data view or I want to use this field here in the report view. Therefore, if you go to modeling right here, you also have these calculation options. So this is a first glance at the interface and at the different ribbons. It's just important to keep in mind that we have different views with different purposes and different options available. Two last things here maybe when it comes to the interface. Here we can save our project or undo or redo our last action, also quite helpful feature. And here in the file ribbon, we have options related to the Power BI file itself, like saving data or like accessing the options and settings. So that's the data model, but what about the query editor now? The query editor is the data preparation part. So actually this is a step ahead of the actual data model. As I said, whenever you start Power BI Desktop, you are in the report view in the data model. To access the query editor, you can simply click onto this button right here, this one. With that, we learned that already a new window will open, so a tool inside the tool, so to say, the query editor. And this part is all about the data preparation, the connection to the source files, and about shaping our data. The interface in the query editor looks a bit different, though the general structure when it comes to four different core areas is kind of the same. You again have some ribbons up here. You have the actual content in the center of the screen, and then you have information to the left and to the right here. Let's again get started with the information to the left, this queries column. The queries column simply shows you all connections you have to source files. In our case, we have a single connection to the GDP data file and the corresponding data it contains. Therefore, we have one query here. In the right part of the screen, you can access settings related to this query. First, we can change the name right here if you want to. So you can simply type something right here, press enter, then the name gets updated. I won't change the name at this stage though. And you have the applied steps. The applied steps are a very important feature because undoing steps as we just saw it in the data model is not possible. But this applied steps is actually a way more powerful tool because you can undo steps by clicking onto this X symbol right here. Or you can even jump back to previous steps by clicking onto the step here in this column, like this. Now we are one step ahead of renaming our columns, as you can see it right here. If you want to jump back, just click right there. So the columns here to the left and to the right are all about managing our queries, our connections to the source files. In the center of the screen, we have the data loaded into Power BI Desktop. We talked about this already. And above this table, you have this formula bar. This formula bar is the code behind our applied steps. 
because all these steps are applied via a specific programming language, you could say, the M language, also covered later throughout the course. And as Power BI is a user-oriented tool, we don't have to write code on our own. We can though, but we don't have to. And if you want to see what's behind these steps, you can see this here in this formula bar. By the way, if you can't see this formula bar, you can go to this view ribbon up here and simply activate it right there. Now it's disabled, now it's enabled. Same thing applies for the query settings. In case you cannot see this column, just disable or enable it right there. And this brings us already to the ribbons once again. As you can see, the ribbons look different when comparing it to the ones we saw in the data model. And here in the query editor, the ribbons are very important as these ribbons contain all the actions we can apply to our actual data here in the query editor. You just saw this here with the view ribbon where you can specify which type of information should be displayed. You again have a home ribbon with some core tools like connecting Power BI desktop to data sources or working on columns or rows. But you also have some detailed options here as we saw it in the data model. So for example, the transform part here where you can use the first row as headers as we did it already in the introduction project. If you want to dive deeper into transforming, then simply go to the transform ribbon. Here you have lots of options all related to transforming or shaping data. Of course, we'll have a look at all these options throughout the course. It's just important to keep in mind that interactions with the actual data are applied either via the ribbons up here or via right-clicking onto a specific part in the actual data. So these are the two ways how you can interact with your data. Finally, we have some options not directly related to the data. At first, it's the save option right here. You notice already, if you do so, you can save your current status of the report. And we again have file options to save the file or to access the options in general. And you have close and apply, apply or close. These are options to leave the query editor. For the moment, we can just click close and apply to do so. With that, we are back in the data model. And as we now saw the interface of the query editor and this data model, it's now time to dive into the recommended settings and also to create a blueprint project file, which we can use to follow along this course conveniently. In the next course module, we'll get started with the course project. For this, we need an empty Power BI desktop project file. And I want to make sure that we are all starting with the same file settings. Otherwise, this can cause some inconveniences throughout the course. To avoid this, let's create this file now and let's set the options correctly there. For this, we'll close our current initial project CSV file. And we can, of course, save the changes. That's fine. And now we will open a new Power BI Desktop file by simply opening Power BI Desktop again. We can close this pop-up. And now I want to access the options. We know how this works already. We go to File, Options and Settings. And here we go to Options. In here, we have two different types of options. We have global options and current file options. Global options are applied to Power BI Desktop in general. This means this applies to all our Power BI Desktop projects we have on our computer. Current file options, as the name indicates, only apply for the currently open project file. And that's very important, because if you start a new project, you have to make sure that the current file options are set according to your needs. And that's also the reason why I want to create this blueprint project file together now, because with this, we can make sure that we are all starting with the same settings. Let's get started with the global options though. Here, we only have one important thing actually when it comes to this course project. The regional settings right here, this model language should be set to English United States. Make sure to do so, as this would have an impact onto the way Power BI interacts with strings, for example. So that's the first setting you should change. This could be set to use application language in your case, therefore make sure to change it to English United States. Now we continue with the current file options. First, we go to data load, and here it's important to unselect all boxes when it comes to type detection and relationships. These are not bad options at all. These can be very helpful options in your own project. 
But in this course, I want to make sure that each step we perform is performed manually by us, as we want to understand how Power BI works. Therefore, we should unselect first the type detection, which would automatically detect data formats, for example, or column names, and relationships, which would automatically establish relationships in our project file, also something we want to do on our own. So this looks all right here. The next option are the regional settings down here. This is the locale. We talked about this in the introduction project already. And the locale is a crucial setting when it comes to formatting and interpreting numbers, dates, and more. Make sure to set this to English United States here because this will allow you to conveniently follow along this course. Let's press OK now. And in case you get the warning that you should restart Power BI Desktop to make sure the changes are applied, you can do so. But before you do this, make sure to save this blueprint file. That's very important because we will use this project in the next module. For this, we simply click onto this save symbol here. Now you navigate to a folder of your choice and let's maybe call this project blueprint here and let's save this. Now make sure to close this file because you might have to restart it to apply all changes. And now let's reopen this file, this project blueprint PBIX file. And here we go. Now we prepared our project and now we're ready to get started with Power BI Desktop. And how do we get started? Well, with our course project and with the data preparation. So it's time to dive deeper into the query editor now in the next module.